Welcome back to New Market Arms, and today we're going to start off with what's going to be a three-part series on the rare and famous World War II Johnson Model 1941 rifle. So in part one, we're going to just give a, a history of the rifle, how it came to be, a little bit of history about Melvin Johnson and kind of what happened to these rifles um, after their, their service in World War II, because they had a continued service on up into the 1960s and 1970s. And then in part two, we're going to talk about assembly and disassembly of the rifle. And then finally, in part three, we'll do a little bit more detailed breakdown of some of the individual components and then do a couple slow-mo videos of the weapon in operation. So let's go ahead and uh, get started with a little bit of history about the rifle. The designer of the Johnson model 1941 rifle was Melvin Maynard Johnson, Jr., Melvin Johnson was a graduate of both Harvard University and Harvard Law School, but his heart was always in firearms and firearms design. He was a patriotic young man, and after graduating law school, Johnson was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps Reserve. During the mid to late 1930s, he wrote several articles for the Marine Corps Gazette, and one of these was a critique of the then-new M1 rifle as designed by John Guerin. Johnson's main critique was that the M1 used a gas trap design, which he found several flaws with, and because of its in-block clip loading design. There were other things that he pointed out that were problematic with the rifle, but those were the main two. And in fact, the gas trap design would ultimately uh, be removed from the, the, the final design of the rifle. An interesting story that comes from this time is one relayed by Bruce Canfield in his definitive work, on the Johnson rifle and machine gun. And in the story, Melvin Johnson got involved with a law firm client because he was practicing law with his father, who was also an attorney. The name of the company was the United Automatic Rifles Company. And he got involved as an attorney working on patent work, but ultimately he got his, rolled up his sleeves and began to get involved in firearms design. And it ended up being a fiasco as there were problems with the design that he worked on there were issues with the ammunition. There was a lot of money spent, and it was it was kind of a mess for the law firm. But it led Melvin Johnson's fa father, Melvin Sr., to ask his son famously, what will it be, son, law or guns? Well, he continued to work as a lawyer at his father's law firm, but he never turned his back on firearms design. Now, the dominant design of the late 1930s, and the design actually began prior to that in the 1920s, and this was the rifle that was also ultimately selected to replace the 1903 as the standard service rifle was the famous M1 rifle designed by John Garand at Springfield Armory. The M1 rifle was formally adopted as the standard service rifle in 1936. As noted, though, Melvin Johnson did not think highly of the M1, and he did not like taking no for an answer. So he founded Johnson Automatics Incorporated to develop his recoil-operated rifle design. His design would become the model 1941 semi-automatic rifle, and he thought his rifle was every bit as good as the M1 rifle and better. As a result, Melvin Johnson began to lobby Congress to reopen the weapons test that led to the adoption of the M1 rifle. Johnson was obviously persuasive enough because Congress would hold several rounds of hearings over the merits of the two rifle designs, and they essentially ordered the Ordnance Department to reconduct a series of tests of the M1 in a head-to-head -head test between the M1 and the Johnson 1941. Johnson's Model 1941 rifle performed perfectly fine during the test compared with the M M1, but the performance was not so superior to warrant discarding the M1 design, especially when you consider all of the money that was spent in the tooling which was set up for M1 production at Springfield Armory. And the M1 rifle was again selected as the Ordnance Department's standard service rifle. Johnson, with his ties in the Marine Corps, then tried to convince the Marines to purchase his Model 1941 rifle, but the Marines, they were content to use their existing Model 1903 rifles until they could receive the M1. So Johnson went out and sought foreign contracts, and the Netherlands ultimately placed a contract for the rifle to be issued to the Royal Netherlands East Indies Army. Only about 2,000 of these rifles, just under 2,000, were delivered to the Dutch East Indies before shipments were suspended by the U.S. government due to the Japanese invasion. Johnson was then able to convince the Marine Corps to take some of his rifles for the paramarine battalions, 
and it's unclear exactly what the Marine Corps paid for these rifles. Um, from the research I've done, it's almost as if he gifted these weapons to the Marines in the hope of uh, ginning up some interest and possibly some contracts down the road. The U.S. government also offered 10,500 Johnson Model 1941 rifles to the Free French Military in April 1944, and those rifles were issued to French units in North Africa. An unknown number of rifles were also sent to Nationalist China, and there are also reports of Johnson rifles being used by the Communist PLA, People's Liberation Army, during the Chinese Civil War. Another post-war, post-World War II use of the Johnson 1941 rifle was its use by anti-Castro forces of Brigade 2506 during the Bay of Pigs invasion of 1961. On the left, you can see members of Brigade 2506 training with their Model 1941 rifles in Central America. The Bay of Pigs, as we all know, was a disaster for the anti-Castro forces, however. And as you can see in the photo on the right, Castro's army ended up with all of the Model 1941 rifles used by Brigade 2506. Now, only about 22,000 Model 1941 rifles were manufactured in total. And with them being used in hot spots all over the world, and there were contracts for those rifles in Mexico and in Chile, there are very few of them around today in the United States, making them one of the most sought after of World War II era rifles. Quick note about Johnson's bolt design, which will be familiar to anyone who's ever disassembled an M16 or AR-15. That's because Melvin Johnson worked in 1955 with the Fair, uh, Fairchild Corporation, along with Armalite, as they developed and tried to promote Eugene Stoner's AR-10 design. Johnson essentially designed the AR-10 bolt, and that design was continued on with Eugene Stoner's AR-15 design. Now, some quick specs on the Johnson 1941 rifle. Fully assembled, the rifle is almost 46 inches long, and the barrel could be disassembled rather easily, reducing the overall length to 32 and a quarter inches, which is why the Marine parachute units like it. Compared to the M1 Garand, its nemesis in the late 1930s, the 1941 rifle is about two and a half inches longer, which is not insignificant when you're talking about carrying a rifle, particularly in uh, dense vegetation. It carries 10 rounds compared to the M1, which only held eight rounds in an M-block clip. Rifles weight about the same. In comparing the two, they have their pluses and minuses, but the 1941 was a fully functional and reliable semi-automatic rifle that was in some ways ahead of its time. Ultimately, though, the M1 won out because of the cost of development and production that had already been sunk into it. So that's it on the history of the rifle. In the next part, part two, we're going to be taking a look at assembly and disassembly of the Johnson 1941 rifle. So thanks for joining us.